Jesus Christ, Word of God, we ask that you'd speak to us this morning. We ask that you would uh, give to us an extra helping, an extra portion of your Holy Spirit that we might be able to discern your words and, um, and that your words might change us, cause us to grow. This morning, I especially want to ask you for uh, those of us who are just in a really hard time, uh, whatever that hard time might be, Father, that your presence would be in us and with us, comforting us, encouraging us, strengthening us. We pray this in your holy and wonderful name. Amen. I left my cell phone at home, so I have to use my tablet this morning to, uh, to be the stopwatch. It will be very big. I will not be able to ignore what time it actually is. <laughs> um, so we have been in the book of Hebrews for, uh, for some time. And I just want to remind you that uh, Hebrews is a, is a book written by a pastor. And he's writing to a congregation where we don't know exactly what they're struggling with, but we know some of what they're struggling with. And the short answer is uh, a lot of hardship. That's the short answer, a lot of hardship. Uh, so I don't often title my sermons until afterwards, and then, and then the title's much easier to come up with after I've preached it. Uh, uh, but this morning, a little bit different. Uh, the title for this morning's sermon is Only in Deep Suffering. I have come to the conclusion in reading the book of Hebrews and preaching through the book of Hebrews that disappointment is a, is a spiritual sensation. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a frame of mind. Disappointment is a spiritual sensation. And um, when I was in the military and when you're training and usually you're kind of like getting hurt and beat up, one of the old adages of military training is pain is weakness leaving the body. Try to help young men to embrace the hardship of training. They say pain is weakness leaving the body. You feel that feeling? Oh, that's, that doesn't hurt. That's that good feeling of weakness leaving you. And you go through enough pain, you're going to be made strong. In the same way, I think that disappointment is the feeling of my will being replaced by God's. And uh, the Hebrew congregation was going through a lot of disappointment. Not the kind of disappointment when um, someone screws up and fails to uh, do what they should do. And you're like, wow, that's kind of disappointing. Uh, not the kind of disappointment where it's like you saw the movie trailers and you're like, that's going to be a great movie. And then you pay the $15 and you go and see the movie and you walk out and you go, what a disappointment. Like, I should have just watched the trailer. That was much better than the actual movie. Um, not that kind of disappointment. I'm talking about the disappointment that comes when your whole life changes and, and the path of life that you consciously or unconsciously were like, here's where my life is going. And then things happen. And it's like, boy, we took a hard right turn. And now this thing over here that was in front of me, it's not even possible anymore. That, and I, I really wanted that. <laughs> and, uh, that feeling of like, I'm never going to have that. <coughs> But now what I'm going through, this is my new forever, you know. That feeling. Ah, I don't like this. And, and, and I can't do this. And no, 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 no. That's what I'm talking about. That's the, I think, sort of spiritual feeling of disappointment. And the congregation of the Hebrew uh, people were going through that kind of disappointment. 
Not the kind of disappointment that's like, gee, I wanted a $1.5 million house and I got a $1.4 million house. I'm a little disappointed. But the kind of thing that's like, um, I looked in our bank account this morning and it's all gone. And, um, and we haven't paid our bills for three months, sort of like accidentally it was on auto pay and then it didn't happen. And we're actually being foreclosed on tomorrow. And, um, and my car broke down and I just got fired. And, um, and then your wife's like, yeah, and I got cancer. And you're like, what the heck is going on? And kids are like, also, I'm failing out of school and I'm hooked on drugs. You're like, what the heck? They're like, yesterday, everything was fine. And now today, it's all bad. It's all terrible. And now I want you to imagine going through that. It only ever really gets worse. And then do that for a decade. And that's where the Hebrew church was. And I find it interesting that the pastor who wrote this letter, he, you know, he has many different tools to try to encourage and exhort his congregation. Sometimes he's massaging their shoulders going, you could do this. Like, you know, remember God's goodness. You could, you could do this. So like, you know, put your dukes up and get back in there and keep fighting. And sometimes he's like, don't worry, it's not going to last forever. Like, like there's an end point to this. And you want to be found. You, you want, when, when the final bell rings, uh, to be the guy who stood in the ring and, and went 25 rounds uh, with the world and the devil. And, uh, and you can do this. And sometimes he stops that altogether and he slaps his audience in the face. And he's like, how dare you? Um, you can, don't you quit. He's doing all kinds of different things. One of the most interesting things that he does is found in chapter 11. Now, I preached on chapter 11 a couple of weeks ago, there was one thing that I missed. If you're looking for a definition for what faith is, and I had suggested, suggested that faith is sort of, it's the quality to love and trust God no matter what's going on. And I, now I've heard many different sermons over my life, and I'm sure you have too, on Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. It is uh, the favorite place of many people to go because it seems so clear. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, but if you don't read any further, what it sounds like is that faith is the ability to pretend something into reality. And that is in no way what the author of Hebrews is talking about. Like, in no way. You have to stop right there and not read any further to come to that conclusion. And yet many people do. And in fact, even in theological circles, especially on the conservative side of things, you will hear, so like, whoa, 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 wait. Faith is actually very easily defined, and the Bible does that for us in chapter 11 and verse 1. And, um, and I actually, I missed that a couple of weeks ago. Because there's actually many def definitions found in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 is just one definition. He actually spends the entire chapter defining what faith is over and over and over again and giving different examples so that you won't come away from chapter 11 with the wrong conclusion. He defines it as the thing by which the people of old received their commendation. He defines it that way. You know all those old heroes in the Bible? You know how we go like, wow, Good for that guy. Good for that gal. Like, they really did the right thing. What gave them the ability to do that right thing? That was faith. Uh, he says that faith is the thing by which we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. I've never heard faith described that way. Faith is knowing, being confident that God created everything. That's what faith is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, that God made the visible universe out of things that can't be seen. That's faith. What is faith? Faith was the way that Abel was um, able to offer a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. Abel was commended as righteous because he gave to God of his best and his first. And that was faith. And through his faith, even though he died, he still speaks. That's faith. The fact that Abel's story is still speaking to us, that's faith. 
What did Abel do that Abel ain't still around whispering to people? He's actually, what does this guy mean? He means that God saw to it long after Abel was dead that his story would be written down, that you and I would be able to read his story and go, wow, that guy got cracked on the head with a rock when he wasn't looking for offering a good sacrifice to God, and he died quite unjustly. And us being reminded of that story is the power, that power for God to pick up the story and carry it forward. That came from Abel's faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up so that he wouldn't see death. That's what faith is. The ability to just not taste death. Um, Faith is the ability to please God. That's verse 6. Have you ever felt in your life like you knew that God was pleased with what you were doing? Have you ever had that feeling? Whether it was giving, serving, worshiping, whatever it was. Maybe the battle that day was just to get up off the couch. Maybe that was the battle that day, and you knew by getting up off the couch and opening up the door and going out into the sunshine, you could feel God's pleasure. That, that was an exercise of your faith. It was by faith that Noah didn't didn't just uh, build an ark, but it was the feeling that he had that enabled him to build the ark. The Bible says, God forewarned, he said, hey, Noah, disaster's coming. And Noah, in his heart, went, ooh, I don't like disasters. I want to do what I, what do I need to do to escape this disaster? That feeling, that fear, was faith. Faith is what caused Abraham to obey. When God said, leave your people, go out. Faith is the ability to walk. To not know where you're going. Except to know, it's not here. (laughs) Go, I'll show you. Which way? That way. Okay. How much do I need to pack? Don't worry about it. Just start walking. Abraham actually threw on a backpack and started walking. That's faith. Faith is what gave Sarah the ability to conceive. And if you read that story and you know that story, she didn't have a lot of faith. (laughs) God was like, you're going to have a baby. And she was like, no, I'm not. He was like, yes, you are. And Abraham was like, and she was like, oh, okay, yeah. That was faith. By faith, uh, Abraham was able to offer up his son. In verse 13, uh, here's another definition of faith. These all died in faith, not having received. Which is like, ooh, that hurts my heart. Uh, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, these promises that God had given to them, they believed them. It enabled them to obey. It enabled them to walk. It enabled them to conceive. It enabled them to do these things. And even though they died, not having received the full promise, still it was faith that enabled to see the promises from afar, to keep their eyes up from where their feet were right here in the present moment and look up into the future and say, I see a bright future that God has for me, and I believe it. That's faith. It enabled them to be strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. That's faith. To be able to speak to other people and say, I'm glory bound. I'm headed somewhere. And when this old body slumps over dead and wrinkly and smelly, don't you think that I'm dead? I'm going somewhere. Verse 16, as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. That desire for something better than what we have right now, no matter how bad it is and no matter how good it is, that's what faith is. I I just take that sort of detour because I'm actually not preaching in Hebrews chapter 11 today, no matter what it might have seemed like so far. Um. Because this was what the Hebrew church that was shaken, pressed, crushed, bent low. This is what they needed. They needed faith. Not the ability to pretend their problems away. 
but their ability to see past their problems to the one who gives the promises. Their ability to flee the pain of the presence, the pain, the pain of the present, <coughs> and choose instead to be surrounded by God's presence. After giving all of these definitions and examples, and this is where I closed my sermon two weeks ago with chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is, he's saying, all of these people who had faith, each in their own way, each in their own measure, some like Elijah had great faith, some like Sarah had tiny faith, but they all had faith and it was enough. And now they've made it. They're in the far country. But they also are surrounding you and I right now. And what are they doing? Cheering us on. <laughs> yeah. I made it. You can too. And that's why we're surrounded by all these witnesses, these people through Scripture who can raise their hand and say, um, my faith was enough. Miraculously. <laughs> Abraham's faith was enough. And if you read Abraham's story, you're like, what the heck? This guy had very little faith. Like out of 10 stories, there's only one that he gets right. He had terrible faith, lots of failure. And yet Abraham is raising his hand in this cloud of witness and saying, my faith was enough because of the one who promised, the one who is present, the one in whom I placed my faith. So, that's why we should lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us. And really, today, my message, only in deep suffering, is about that word, endurance. Because endurance is a function of faith. That's why we run out of spiritual steam. That's why our sales, our spiritual sales, seem to, you know, lose their tension and there's just no air in them and we're not going anywhere. It's because our faith needs to grow. Our faith doesn't have the legs to go the distance. But kind of what the author of the book of Hebrews is saying is, but that's okay, right? It's okay. Even a faith that, that, that doesn't have the legs to go, still, if, if it will just lean on God, it will be enough. But this is the critical difference. The difference between a faith that ultimately fails when it is shaken and pressed and bent and broken versus a faith that even though it's shaken, pressed, bent, and broken, still can endure, it comes down to the single choice, which is, will I, in this moment, Choose the presence of God or not. And the Hebrews were certainly hard-pressed. They underwent many temptations. They underwent many persecutions. The Romans severely punished uh, Christians. And the Hebrew Christians uh, more so because the Romans really didn't like the Jews. But the Jews had, uh, by writ of the emperor, an, an exemption from Roman spiritual religious oppression. The Jews were able to not have to abide by all of the rules that everyone else in pagan society had to abide by. They were allowed to not work on their Sabbath. They were allowed to go to the temple to not pray to the emperor, all of those sort of things. Uh, the Christians weren't. But then the Christians were um, pretty pagan, and, um, and they had the ability to band together and in uh, dark places and out-of-the-way places uh, keep their faith and their hope alive um, because they were people of the majority, and so ultimately they could blend in. The Hebrew Christians got the worst of both worlds and the benefit of neither. 
They could not retreat into their Judaism and say, Rome, leave me alone. And they could not retreat into their Christianity because they were too Jewish. And the Gentile Christian, they didn't really fit in there. So they were hard-pressed. They were persecuted. They were being crushed. And it's not like as soon as they met some resistance, they ran off. They started with great faith. And, and in fact, that's, that's what the author of Hebrews says. Like, you were doing really well. You were going to prison, laughing and singing and praising. You were sticking up for those people who were being persecuted. You were, you were doing all this wonderful, these wonderful things, but now you're not. You're doing the form of them, but you've lost all of your actual real faith and endurance. And so he says they need to do something in order to endure. And this is in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, are you hard-pressed? I know some of you are. Are you disappointed? And I'm talking about the real disappointment, that spiritual feeling of your will being burned out <laughs> and God's will being replaced. I know that is, some of us are dealing with that right now. Some of the, us have been in that season for a while. Some of us are just coming into that season. And some of us are about to go into that season. But I believe that if God actually loves us, if he actually wants us to grow, he allows us to go through real suffering deep suffering, because there are things, benefits that are found only in deep suffering. There are things that you cannot learn. There are things, ways that you cannot grow unless you go into deep suffering. And the author of Hebrews is saying, if there was any who deserved to walk on cushions his whole life and have God make his entire life pleasant beyond belief, it would have been our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet his own testimony was, foxes have holes in the ground, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. They will hate you as, as they have hated me. They will persecute you as they have persecuted me. Um, and while he was hanging on the cross, dying, he said, I'm thirsty. Like he was deprived. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. That's our example. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Is like, hang on a second. First, I want you just to look, look at who our Lord is. Look at his example. Be inspired by him. And he didn't go through all of that suffering, whining and complaining and saying, God, no, 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 no. He had joy. He despised all of the shame that was heaped upon him. He thought little of it. And guess where he is right now? That's right, in the far off country. He's there. Verse 3, consider him. And I suppose uh, this would be like point number one. Are you hard pressed? Well, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? This is what he's saying. Remember when Jesus was like, hey, if your right hand's causing you to sin, cut it off. Hey, if your eye is causing you to sin, pull it out. Because you don't want sin. It's better to go in, into heaven missing digits and eyes than to be cast into hellfire totally whole. This is the author of Hebrews is saying, you're letting your sin get, in the, get the better of you. You're giving yourself permission 
And actually, this is what dis disappointment spiritually does to us. This is a side effect of disappointment. We indulge ourselves. We say, well, I'm going through something right now, and so I get to. But it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. <laughs> you know, we even know it, you know. You know what? I'm going through something right now. I'm just going to get drunk out of my mind and forget all my pain. Like, that's not good. When you wake up, you'll still have all your problems, and you'll be hungover. And you'll feel full of shame that you did it. Uh, there are many things and ways in which we, and some are socially acceptable, some are not socially acceptable. And when we go through disappointment and pain and deep suffering, we give ourselves permission to do things that are not choosing life, not choosing the Lord, not embracing his presence. But we're saying, let me act selfishly for a while so I can make myself feel better. And what that does is counteracts the very thing that God is trying to do in our lives. When you take a piece of fruit, let's say you don't know what kind of fruit it is. It's in an opaque bag, but there's tiny little holes in the bag that you can't see through necessarily. But if you take that bag, you grab that fruit, and you squeeze it, and you crush it, juice is going to come out of those little holes that you can't see through. You'll be able to know what is in that bag by the kind of juice that comes out. Oh, that's apple juice. That's because you had an apple in there that you were twisting. Only in deep suffering do our souls get twisted and crushed. And then we get to see what kind of what kind of fruit, fruit juice comes out. And I, it pains me to admit that oftentimes I am appalled by the stench <laughs> that emanates from my own soul. Um, and so the trap number one is to give ourselves permission to do things that we shouldn't. Trap number two is to think that it's due to a relationship error. And this is why the author of Hebrews says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? I read it in our call to worship from the book of Proverbs. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't be weary when <clears throat> reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves chastises every son whom he receives. Uh, this is the point in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs actually spends a number of chapters just giving to you uh, sort of the tone and tenor of the entire book. And it's uh, the author of the Proverbs, presumably Solomon, uh, or saying, hey, um, I want to give you some good advice because I love you. Hey, what I'm giving you is wisdom. It's not folly. Hey, if you listen to me, if you obey the Lord, if you give to him your whole heart, things God will be working for you. Hey, don't forget the Lord and all of his benefits. Don't think that you know everything. You don't know everything. God knows everything. Lean on him and his ways. Do it God's way, not your own way. This is the heart of wisdom. To do things God's way and not our way. Therefore, if disappointment is the feeling that I get when my will is being replaced by God's, it stands to reason that disappointment is the feeling of me becoming wise. Does that make sense? Heresy. Disappointment is not becoming me becoming wise because me becoming wise would feel wonderful. That's what I have in my imagination. Me becoming wise is growing a gray beard stroking it and having all these wonderful thoughts and dispensing advice to people and they go, wow, you're so smart. And I go, thank you. <laughs> no, that's not wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to love and trust God no matter what's happening. That's what wisdom is. In fact, the book of Proverbs itself boils it down this way. This is wisdom. Fear the Lord. <laughs> not have a bunch of wise sayings and be able to dispense advice about you know, how to fall in love and how to have a better marriage and how to raise your kids right and all that sort of stuff is going, I will do whatever he says. That's what wisdom is. And it comes from a place in God's heart that is full of love. 
And, and this, is, this is the hard thing. Isn't this what our, our world, our modern world, gets wrong about parenting? Isn't, this, isn't that exactly this? I love my kid. Why would I ever tell them no? No, no, I love my kid. Why would I ever tell them that what they're doing is wrong? I love my kid. I, I, whatever is in their mind, that's what we are all going to do. But what that means is you don't love your kid. That's what that means. Is it, isn't it crazy that God would set up this sort of foundation stone, these stepping stones, which is like, if you really love, if a, a, a parent, if a father really loves their children, they will discipline them. Even though the discipline doesn't feel good. And as a father, I can tell you, it hurts me worse than it hurts you. I don't want to have to discipline my children. I want them to be free and be full of God's vivacious life giving force and making good decisions. And there they are, pooping on the lawn in broad daylight. And I was like, what the heck is wrong with you? Uh, we got to bring in some discipline. There they are, tearing down their siblings or something. And actually, it's up to the father to say, no, we're not going to do that. And if you can't control yourself, guess what? I'm going to control you, and you're going to hate it. It's not going to feel good in the moment. But actually, when those kids grow up, what are they going to say? My dad raised me right. I was not allowed to behave like that. They're going to be in the workplace, and other, all of their peers are going to be like, but I don't want to work. Why would you even expect me to work? I need some time off today. And you should just pay me without me doing any work. Now, that's what they're actually doing in the, in the workplace these days. Why? Because their parents didn't love them enough to discipline them. Not my kids. My kids are going to be like, heck yes. And after I'm done with that, what else? And they're going to rise to the top. And I'm going to be an old gray guy with a bent back and arthritis all over. And they're going to be like, dad, you were awesome. Thank you so much for disciplining me. I am so, like, I have so much more than my peers have because you made that investment into me. And this is verse 7, and I think it is the most biggest main point. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Now, I suppose there's an entire sermon here, but I'll have to limit myself to just one point. It doesn't say it's for punishment that you have to endure. That's not what he says. He says it's for discipline that you have to endure. And this is the second error that I think only happens in deep suffering. The first one is just to excuse any of my behavior. Well, I deserve to and lay off me because I'm hungry and I'm weak and I'm tired and I need to be able to do this. And don't you think worse of me for making these decisions? That's the first mistake. The second mistake is to say, God doesn't love me. I've done something wrong. He hates me. And I don't even know what I've done that's wrong. I was like, God, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this to me? I've spent my whole life loving you, and now you're allowing me to go through this deep suffering. Like, a lot of times, the suffering that we're going through is not punishment. God does punish us. I'm not saying he doesn't punish us. Of course, God punishes us. But when he punishes us, we know. <laughs> it's not a mystery. Oh, hey, I did that thing over there, and now I'm reaping the consequences. Thank you, Lord. Um, I'm going to do better next time. Discipline is something else entirely. So, like, I take my kids out, and we're going to go on a hike. And um, we get to the turnaround point, and they're like, I'm tired, and I don't want to walk. What do I do? Do I carry them the whole way? Maybe if they're really little. I don't know, you got legs. You could do it. No, I can't. I'm too tired. No, you can't. We actually haven't got that far. And I know how you feel right now. I know it feels like you can't go any further and your feet are sore and all that. We've only gone three quarters of a mile and it's just three quarters of a mile back. And actually, once we get going and walking, we're, we're going to go over this rise and then around the corner and then you'll see our van. All right? And then we can be done. Wouldn't it be weird for my child to say, no, because you won't carry me, you must not love me. It's like, no, it's because I love you that I'm not carrying you. And I know it's hard. 
but you actually need to build confidence in yourself for what actually you can do. You need to be able to push through it. This is what discipline is. Discipline is still hard. It's still suffering, but it creates in us the ability to endure if, if we don't give up. If we don't give up. If we have the faith to make that choice in the moment. Am I going to reject God and say, I'm not going to step further until you? Or are we going to say, God, this really sucks. I don't know what's going on. I certainly don't like it. But I will still choose to trust you and obey you and love you. Now, now, give me your presence. Because that is not something that God ever withholds from his children. There are many different types of suffering that we do have to go through. God never asks us to go somewhere without him. That is an incredible comfort. God is treating you as son. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness for the moment. All discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let me summarize what he's saying here in some bullet points. He's saying, I know it's hard, guys. I know it's terrible, guys. I know you don't like it, guys. But God, this is not a relationship issue in which God's saying, I don't like you because of things that you did. I'm going to smite you. That's not what's happening. What's happening is God has been impressed with you and your life. And he's saying, it's time for more. I want to I make you more. I want to put you through more. And that only happens in deep pain. We can only learn to trust God more when we have to trust him more. That's the only time we can learn it. Can't learn it by reading about it in a book. Can't learn about it by imagining it. It has to actually make its way from its head, from our head to our hearts. And the only path through is deep suffering. It only happens in deep suffering. He's saying, this is the truth. You're a son. That's who you are. You're not an illegitimate child. You're not a stepchild. You're not a foster kid who's going to get yanked out of the family and sent off to juvie. That's not going to happen. You're a son. You're an heir. You have the clothing of the father. You have the bearing of the father. You have the example of the son. So let me tell you what sons are like. Sons endure. That's what they do. They endure. Because they know that it's for discipline's sake. Would you want to be in an army unit where it's like, hey, we don't do discipline here. We got some weapons over there, some armor and stuff over there. Have fun. Do whatever you want. Would you want to be in that unit? I know I sure wouldn't. Especially if there's a war. Especially if there's actual bullets in the, in the guns. And I'd be like, mm, I don't want to have any part to do with an undisciplined unit. Now let's say they're like, hey, you've been selected to this elite group of soldiers. And you show up, and there's some you know, hard-eyed sergeant with a chiseled face. Who's like, get in line. We do discipline here. Like, thank God. You know? Awesome. I know I'm going to be better. I know I'm going to be able to rely on my teammates. I know like everything's going to be better when we have discipline. That's what it is. Discipline, not punishment. And it gives us the ability to endure. In fact, in modern militaries, basically all of the schools of the military from most basic, basic training to the most elite military units are essentially this. How much do we expect you to endure? If it's basic training, hey, we expect you to endure a little bit. More than civilians, certainly. You're going to be able to go out and march in the rain. You're going to be able to 
When you get all the way over here, it's like these are guys who can not eat and sleep for days and still stay on it. These are guys who know how to control their breathing and uh, like do all these things. It's like, the, do they have more training? Yes, they do have more training. They can do more stuff. But if you take these guys over here and you give them all this great weapons training and fighting training and stuff like that, they'll never learn it. They don't even have the discipline to know how to do the things. These guys over here have great endurance. They've been through a lot of pain. And when you look at all the badges and things on their uniform, it's basically you just know how much pain they've gone through. It's like, wow, that guy's got a lot of pain he's gone through. Wow, you must be awesome. I thank you, I am. How do I know? Because I've gone through all of this. I know how to endure. Sons of God endure. Sons of God are alive. Sons of God are being made holy. Sons of God will reach perfection. Sons of God are made wise in our suffering. Sons of God live in peace. And it is the sons of God who obtain grace. Thank you, Jesus. Sons of God endure. All of that's in that paragraph there. They are alive. They're made holy. They reach perfection. They are made wise in our suffering. They live in peace. And they obtain grace. <coughs> now we come to the payoff. Verse 12, and I'll read through to 17. But really my main point has already been made. This is the therefore. There's a list of do's and there's a list of don'ts. Hey, 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 you know, wake up, stop doing the things you're doing. This is what you need to do. Put your eyes on Christ. This is what he's like. This is what God's doing in you. He's creating discipline. He's causing you to, to endure. He's making you wise. He's causing you to bear fruit. Don't give up. Choose God's presence. Here's how you do that, practically speaking. And at this point in uh, the sermon, the author who wrote the book of Hebrews to these crushed and oppressed uh, Christians, his pace changes. His volume changes. Let me see if I can demonstrate it for you. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. By it, many become defiled, so that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is what he's saying. He's giving them an exhortation, trying to kind of pump up some spiritual energy into them. Come on, guys. Reach for it. Lean into it. Don't give up. Lift up your chin. Because you are near disaster. Here's some things that you need to start doing. Strive for peace with everyone. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. These are instructions that are not about the interior life, are they? Hey, it's for discipline you need to endure. So like, 
read the Bible more and meditate more. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? Start looking out for the people on the left and the right of you. That's going to help you. Actually, as someone who's gone through military training, that's true. That's true. The more elite units are guys who know how to click out of the suffering in their brain and go, wow, this is really hard right now. I need to take care of this guy here and this guy here. and We need to do this together. And actually, that's how, that's how it happens. And this is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that the root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. Okay, so here's the last thing that he says, which is a don't. He's saying, here's what you need to do. Here's what you shouldn't do. The root of bitterness uh, is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 29. You remember the book of Deuteronomy where after all is said and done, Moses is standing before the people right before he dies, and he's like, hey, there's two paths before you. You can go down this path, which is death and destruction and awfulness, or you can go down this path, which is life and amazingness. Okay? It's in the middle of that speech. Chapter 29, verse 17. I'll only read a couple of verses so that you can uh, see what he's saying here as he quotes it in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, You have seen their detestable things. This is the nations around them that they shouldn't be like. You have seen their detestable things. Their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which were among them. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. There you go. That's the root of bitterness. The root of bitterness is saying, I know what the right thing to do is. I'm going to do it a little bit, but I still want my way. And so that, that disappointment that you feel isn't actually my will being replaced with God's will. It's me fighting with God and doing everything I can to still get what I want while yielding to him maybe as much as I think will satisfy him. That is the root of bitterness. That is a faith that will bear no fruit. That is the way of destruction. Don't do that. Then he gives us an example, and this is Esau. Don't be sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. This is not the only place in the Bible that links not following God, pretending that you're following God, but not following him with sexual immorality, which I think is metaphorical in a sense. It's like idolatry in the Old Testament, but I also think it's practical. I I actually think that when you walk away from God for a certain amount of time, sexual immorality is definitely where you're headed, for certain. Uh, And that's what Esau was like. He sold his birthright for a single meal. And so if you remember that story, Um, He kind of gets tricked by Jacob. He comes in out of the field and he's hungry. And Jacob's cooking stew. And he says, give me some of that stew, I'm hungry. And Jacob says, trade you a bowl of stew for your birthright. And Esau goes, done. So if you see this as one guy who made one mistake one time and he never got forgiveness for it, then you're actually seeing it totally wrong. Like, that's the way Esau lived. It was so reliable. It was so obvious that his brother could be like, oh, all I have to do to get the birthright is wait until he's hungry and have a bowl of stew there. He actually has no ability to see into the distance and say, that's where I'm headed. That's what I want. Can only see the things in the present. And he always sacrifices everything for pleasantness right now. So all you had to do was be in the right place at the right time with a bowl of soup. Esau comes along. Hey, I'm I'm hungry. I want that soup. Sure, give me your birthright. Done. Here's your soup. In other words, that episode in the Bible, is Esau reaping a lifetime of choices? A lifetime so that his character, deep ingrained in his person, was the inability to endure at all. The inability to see into the future and the pleasantness that God has planned for us at all. 
And even though afterwards he wanted to change what had happened, he couldn't because he, it was his signature that signed away his birthright. Like, if you go into the loan shark and you pull out $2 million at 50% interest and you sign on the dotted line, then you go out and spend that money. And then the loan sharks start coming after you. Do you really want to undo that deal? Yeah, you do. But guess who did it? You. <laughs> guess who spent all the money? You. You're the one who did it. This is what the author of Hebrews is asking us to consider. Am I, in my disappointment, in my deep suffering, am I choosing to focus on the present pleasant things so much so that I'm willing to sacrifice actually what God's trying to accomplish? Or am I, even without understanding really what God's trying to do, am I going to lean in and trust him? Am I going to seek his presence? This is what I want to simply end with. The children of God always have the presence of God available to them. Always. Brothers and sisters, are you hard-pressed? Are you disappointed? Are you going through things that are challenging beyond what you can bear? I bring you good news. You can have the presence of God anytime, anywhere. And you can rely on the fact that God will use your circumstances to make you wise and lovely and wonderful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just ask that you would do that work in me. I uh, ask that you would do that work in anyone this morning who cries out to you in their own way. I pray that you would cause this message to burn upon our hearts. Spirit of God, bring to our attention the places where we are selling our birthright for a bowl of soup. Bring to our attention our spiritual sexual immorality. Help us, Lord God, to, to get our eyes and our feelings off of our present pain and on to our promised future and your presence here and now. Help us to look out for one another. Help us to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens that we might at least have the pleasure of camaraderie in your spirit as we fight this spiritual war in your name and underneath your banner. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and to the will of the Father. Amen.